Hello, drummers and other creatures. Today I'm going to introduce you to the, the sort of concept and, and getting into this idea of playing left hand hi-hat barks, uh, which is going to, again, you may be arranging your kit some other way, <laughs> work it out, um, but we've got left hand hi-hat barks, and it involves developing a little bit of coordination, uh, and in my opinion, this is one of the coolest ways to embellish any sort of groove playing. Uh, this is what we hear Bernard Purdy doing in Rocksteady by Aretha Franklin as a very legendary example of the hi-hat barks, this particular sound. Um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, Purdy invented this or, you know, made it famous or whatever. But this is the very famous example of the particular thing I'm going to do. And uh, the other very famous example of something that I like listening to a lot is Brad Wilkes' uh, fill in Bullet in Your Head by... Bullet in the head, in your head, I can't remember, but bullet in someone's head by Rage Against the Machine. Now, what am I talking about? Let's have a listen. the hi-hat bark. Uh, I probably, <laughs> I made the same quip in the other video, is that really a bark or not? I don't know. That's one of the terms that I know, or maybe the only term I know, so if you know a better term, let me know in the comments below. That's how we get the juices flowing. So, what's going on here? Why is this interesting? Uh, to play the left-hand bark um, takes a little bit different coordination from the right-hand bark that I already made a video out of, and I strongly recommend you learning how to play both of those things, because they both have their uses, and I'm going to approach uh, this informational structure a little bit differently than the other one where I went through the various E's and R's that we can play uh, uh, the, the open hi-hat sound on. Uh, this time I'm going to look from a slightly different angle, but what this entails is opening the hi-hat and getting a nice short sound and most of the time playing the bass as well. So here's the sound on its own. It will mostly be quite short. Um, you can moderate the amount of opening and closing of the hi-hat uh, to give you a slightly thicker or slightly thinner sound. last one that was too much already I don't think that would sound that good but you know try everything and, and see how you can use it and what's going on here is that I'm playing a stroke with the bass drum so I've got my right foot and I'm playing a stroke with my left hand at the same time and that can be a little bit challenging I find it challenging so I've worked on it quite a lot and it doesn't always come out right something to do with the wiring right my right hand and right foot quite happy to do things together my left hand and left foot quite happy to do things together Right foot and left hand, not so much. Uh, right hand and left foot, not so much. And you can work on that. To mess things up, we've also got the open hi-hat, like this. So left hand is going down, left foot is going up, right foot is going down. Thing number one, right foot and left hand. Thing number two, left foot up, left hand down. Oh, it's hard remembering what all these movements are. Right? Put it together. As I said in my other video, I'm, I'm probably playing heel up most of the time to, to get that quick movement. Okay, so that's the first thing to know about and you may want to explore the dynamics of just that one thing on its own to be able to get that uh, psh, quick sort of jerky movement to happen nice and accurately, making sure that the limbs that are opposing each other work together, plus the limbs that are on the same side are playing these oppositional movements, down with the hand, up with the foot, in coordination. And when we're learning how to, to do this drumming stuff, 
or I'm, I'm sure this applies to people learning other things and other instruments, um, we're, we're always thinking about the, the end result, uh, and it's very often useful to just isolate this one thing, whether that's the little bit of coordination in that one stroke. I'm using my three limbs there. I've, I've got to sit on my stool and not let myself fall over as my feet and hands are negotiating. Thankfully, my right hand doesn't have to do anything at the moment. Uh, if you are looking at the right hand bark as well, uh, and I think again I'm repeating slightly the other video, but you can practice that. Two. So, how do we incorporate this into a groove? As I said in the right hand bark video, I worked slightly different uh, logic, and I just, why not change the logic? It, it, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, uh, let's say, if we look at a bar of one and two and three and four and four, four beats in a four, four uh, type of setting, uh, we're going to look at playing the boogaloo, which is the, the R of the two and the E of the three. And you're used to doing this already. So I think it's quite a good thing to translate into making these beautiful hi-hat barks. It's the funkiest thing ever. But we're gonna take this groove where we play the snare on the two and four, but we also play on the R of two and the E of three. Um, you know this pattern, it's one and two and a three E and four and. working within that familiar context. And what we're going to change is thing number one, we're going to move those in-between E 16th notes on the snare up to the hi-hat. Now, the cool kids will bring the left hand up underneath the right hand like so, uh, and that can be quite a good way of doing this. So we go like this. not so cool kids will bring the left hand up on the left side. Um, and again, as with anything, try them both. And I don't think you need to really um, like master everything both ways, but you maybe just try them out and see what feels intuitively easier. Uh, very often I'll play with my stick sort of a little bit further away from me on the hi-hat, and then I leave a bit of space uh, sort of underneath for the, the left hand, so I, I've got free movement of my left hand up and down, and I quite like playing like that, so my hands are in their normal positions. That was very easy access there. Um, but if you have a habit of playing like this, so when I'm in French grip mode, that might be the case for me, where my hand is closer to my body, and then coming up underneath allows me this, but then if I'm doing a lot of left hand stuff, that, that's a pain, to be honest, so mm, anyway. Let's get back to the topic at hand. I'm playing my boogaloo like this. Uh, again, uh, as far as I know, I'm terrified of terminology actually, but I know this is a boogaloo. Get it? Then, Instead of playing the bass drum on the quarters and eights, when I'm playing the sixteenths on the R of two and the E of three, I'm gonna follow that with the bass drum. So I'm gonna uh, play a unison with the bass drum on the R of two and the E of three. So one and two and a three e and four and, okay, like this. At which point you realize how complicated coordination is and how much work we all have to do. <laughs> well, I speak for myself mostly. All right, so we've dealt with the hands and the right foot, but now we're going to separate things a little bit and look at the left foot because we need the hi-hat to open. Again, remember, the bass drum is going to be going down 
on the R of two and the E of three, but the hi-hat is going to be coming up. And so it's a very good idea. And you might want to just throw yourself in and do it and it all sounds okay and that's fine and you can ignore all of this. But if you have any kind of um, uh, issue and you need to approach this a bit patiently, learn how to separate things out, right? And uh, that's what I'm gonna do here. So I'm gonna look at the hi-hat pattern. Why am I counting and drumming at the same time? One and two and a three E and four and. Uh, and I'm going to just attempt to open the, the hi-hat uh, on those 16th notes. And it allows me to kind of focus in. My first couple of strokes weren't working quite well as I wanted to. Uh, and I sort of just let myself adjust my foot. I didn't have to think about it so much, but I just adjusted my foot a little bit. Um, now, uh, we could even break that down a little bit further and just play the two R first, uh, get used to that. do the three E. Do that for a little bit and, and get a sense of, of how well you're coordinating that. Now we do have to obviously bring in the bass drum and you'll notice that I've abandoned playing the snare for the time being but we'll bring that back in. So I'm going to play the bass drum this time and for this again it's a really good idea maybe just to focus on the say the 2R and then do the 3E separately and then put it together one little step at a time now you might find that one little step at a time means you spend one minute doing this and one minute doing that uh, or it might involve an afternoon of practice doing this and then another afternoon of practice doing that uh, it really depends on you know where you want where you are and where you want to go I suppose there's a lot of nebulous stuff here, isn't there? Anyway, so let's try the 2R. And I find that I'm playing my stick, the shoulder of the stick against the edge of the cymbals. It gives a little bit of a uh, nicer, crisper, sound when those uh, hi-hats open instead of just the tip of the stick. Okay, let's do the uh, three E. Now we're gonna combine them. I don't know why I started playing the, the bass on the one, but why not? It's a bit orientating, I guess. Uh, 2R and 3E in succession. Cool, you noticed that my, my balance went off a little bit there. And so uh, while I was doing that, I then had to try and remind myself that I'm sitting on my stool and I'm connected to the ground and you know my weight is there. And again, you may or may not have noticed that then that became part of the, um, the equation of that, you know, when I'm doing two open sounds, maybe that's a little bit undermining the balance. So those are things that it's good to be aware of. Okay, so, now we're gonna bring back the snare and uh, let's just see what happens. So again, uh, your mileage may vary with these things, but I'm just gonna start um, with the snare. Then I'm going to introduce the two and R 
just as a left hand stroke on the hi-hat without doing any open stuff. Um, but I'm gonna uh, unison with the bass and then I'm gonna get that going a little bit and just see if I feel comfortable. Okay, that went all right. Then I'm gonna try and do the same with the three E. Okay, and you're noticing that um, I've got the Oh, I didn't do the open hat thing, did I? Silly me. You, you, no, I had a thought. You're noticing that I've sort of let my bass pattern adjust itself accordingly. At first, I didn't do exactly as intended, but uh, I let it settle in. Let's do that with the open hat. Now we're going to combine those two things, the 2R and the 3E, again first without opening the hi-hat and then opening the hi-hat once I feel a little bit settled. Gratuitous crash there. Um, and that's the that's the sort of inception, if you like, or the the initial sort of left hand hi-hat bark thing that I would I would try and learn how to do. Now we can evolve towards doing some other stuff with this. Uh, so maybe that's another video because who knows how long this is already going on. But let's just uh, see what we can do with this in context. So once once you've got the hang of doing that. Um, you want to maybe work on playing it over and over again. How am I doing for time? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Uh, you want to do it over and over again and um, sort of, you know, internalize it. Make, make yourself feel comfortable with it. And the way to, to really assess that that's come together for you uh, is to maybe learn how to play it and make sure you can play some grooves and fills. Right. So if you're doing uh, a continuous repetition of the pattern, you might do something like this. You try and you know just do some repetitions, but add some fills and see if you're coming back to the the same thing reasonably cleanly. Uh, the other thing you could do is to play and vary whether you're just playing the two R, well maybe just the three E at times, um, and then the whole shebang, the two R and the three E. And again, you're doing that sort of improvisationally. So we'd be going. it in and out a little bit and then finally maybe playing a groove and just very sporadically adding those barks to it so that you know that you can just use it as the occasional uh, embellishment. Some of the time you might want to do that a lot, you're showing off and doing something in your face um, but at other times it might be just enough to accompany a little movement in a song that you're playing uh, and a little change of energy, and you're using it in a slightly more subtle way. So that means you're not like 
lamping it all the time. See, a right-handed one snuck in there, but again, Remember, that's what I was saying. Learn how to do these so that it just all happens automatically. That's it. That's your introduction to the left hand bark. Uh, I'll do a follow up on this uh, specifically related to um, how we use this in, in fills, basically. Uh, that will do for today. Uh, I forgot to advertise myself in the early part of the video, which I've been told I need to do. So uh, apologies to you if you had to sit all the way through this to be reminded that I am available to help you with your drumming uh, online, whether you use Skype or Zoom or any other sort of platform. Uh, I'm also available in real life in Northwest London. You can subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed this to get updates for uh, future videos. Please leave comments in the comments below, even if you hate my guts, apparently that helps the thing. Um, I shouldn't really throw a red rag to a bull like that, should I? But I'm assuming that if you're watching this far, you probably like me well enough, and uh, so on and so forth. Do all the formalities if you don't mind. Now I think it's time for you to go off and practice.